This is your analysis, lecture one, part two. We're going to continue on with the different types of collection methods that are used. Um, the first one we're going to talk about today is catheterization specimen. Um, this is performed to prevent or treat bladder distension when other measures fail. This is one of the reasons why it might be performed. When you talk about bladder distension, when something is distended, it means that it's um, gone beyond capacity and it is over full. So for whatever reason, if your patient is not able to urinate, his bladder will become more and more full to the point where it's very dangerous and obviously very painful. So they will need to use a catheter to be able to relieve that pressure and get the urine out of the bladder. It can also be performed after voiding to determine how much residual urine remains in the bladder. So this would be to see if your bladder is able to contract enough to get rid of all the urine inside of it. You don't want urine to remain in your bladder. That's a means for an infection to start. It can also be used to irrigate or medicate the inside of a bladder. It also may be used for diagnostic purposes. Catheterization is typically performed by a nurse via sterile technique. However, an MA can perform this procedure if they are specifically trained and certified to do so. There are many sizes and lengths and types of catheters. The intake of fluids and output of urine are often measured in patients for whom monitoring the body's fluid balance is important. A pediatric specimen can be obtained in a number of different ways. You can use a catheterization or you can obtain a clean catch midstream specimen. Um, sometimes though those may not be alternatives for the pediatric patient and you need to attach an adhesive pediatric urine specimen bag because um, this is often the method of choice and we are going to learn how to do this so hopefully in your procedures you have read through this. A suprapubic specimen is collected by um, using a sterile needle and syringe. The needle is inserted into the patient's bladder through the abdominal wall just above the pubic bone and the urine sample is withdrawn. Suprapubic specimens are shown to be more reliably free of contamination than the clean catch specimens and the procedure is performed by a physician. This is not something that a nurse or an MA can do. It's used for cytology examinations, which once again, cytology is always looking at the different types of cells that will be extracted from the bladder. Please refer to procedures uh, 46-3, assisting with straight catheter insertion and collecting a sterile urine specimen for detailed instructions. Once again, we will not be going over um, those two in class, but we will need to know how to do those. Okay, so a routine urinalysis. This is typically performed on large numbers of patients to identify potential health problems. Physical analysis may include a description of the appearance, the odor, and volume of urine. A chemical analysis may include tests for pH, specific gravity, glucose, bacteria, protein, and other chemical elements. If the results are abnormal, more specific testing can be ordered to determine a diagnosis and treatment. So in other words, if you end up with an abnormal response when you do a urinalysis test, your physician will most likely order you to put some of that into a uh, certain designated vial and take that to the lab. So what are the physical characteristics that we just talked about? This is whether or not urine appears clear or if it's cloudy. And if it's cloudy, you need to be more specific than just cloudy. You need to tell what degree of cloudiness it is. Is it slightly cloudy? Is it cloudy with sediment, which means particles? Or is it turbid, which means there's many particles that are mixed up in it? Turbidity caused by bacterial infection. Um, it can be white blood cells, red blood cells, or epithelial cells. Epithelial scales, cells are skin cells. It could be pus, which is also known as pyuria. Um, or yeast or vaginal contaminants. What's the appearance? Um, always report exactly what is seen in the sample using the appropriate terms. Always observe the appearance of the specimen before it begins to cool as well. One of the other things that you need to look at is the color. The normal color of urine is straw and you should use that word to describe the urine if it is a straw color, which is a pale yellow color. 
Concentrated urine can cause urine colors to range from pale yellow all the way to an amber, which is a darker red. Diuretics may cause urine to be so dilute that it appears clear. So a diuretic is something that's going to draw water out of your system and put it into your urine. Those are things such as tea or anything with caffeine. Um, you can also have medications that are diuretics that would cause that to happen as well. You can have urine that is brown or black, and this indicates a serious illness. Whenever you have a urine sample that comes back as this color, you need to alert your physician immediately. Reddish brown color may indicate bleeding, either in the urinary tract or from menstruation. You always need to make sure that if the color does come back as that and you have a female patient, that you ask them if they are menstruating at that time. Urine may also come back with an orange color to it, and this is the result of a medication called pyridium. Um, this is a medication used for bladder spasms or pain. Large quantities of B vitamins can also cause the urine to appear a bright yellow. Some medications such as amitriptyline can turn urine even blue or green, so don't be alarmed. If that does happen, you should probably ask your patient if they're on any of those medications. This is a good range of colors that urines may come in. So you have everything all the way from almost clear, where it looks like water, down to a dark brown or black um, color of urine. So urine is really, it's very a wide spectrum of colors. So anything that comes up on this, you need to be able to describe accurately, uh, as well as any other physical characteristics you need to be able to describe. Another physical characteristic is odor. Any abnormal aroma should be documented. Individuals testing positive for ketones may have kind of a fruity odor to their urine and could be indicative of uncontrolled diabetes. You, for the most part, don't want to have ketones in your urine. You, you may come into contact with urine that's very putrid or foul and foul smelling, and this might indicate an infection. This is one of those moments where you really have to have on your game face, because when that happens, um, it really does flip your stomach upside down. So just be ready for a um, very broad range of odors of urine. Um, you can also have an ammonia odor that usually results from urine breaking down over time. They're similar to the odor of old urine in a diaper. Foods such as asparagus and some vitamins can affect the odor of urine, and patients with PKU or phenylketonuria can produce urine with a musty odor. One of the things I want to urge you not to do is do not stick your nose down into a cup of urine to see what the odor is. You'll notice what the odor of urine is just by opening the lid to, um, to the cup that it's in or whatever container that it's in. You do not have to stick your nose down there and smell it. That's not one of the things that you should do, so please make note of that. Okay, you need to pay attention to the quantity. Remember we talked before about quantitative versus qualitative. Once again, quantity is the amount measured uh, when timed urine specimens are collected, but not for routine samples. So a 24-hour urine sample should measure between 700 to 2,000 mLs, with the average being around 1,500, which is roughly three pints. It varies depending on the amount of fluid ingested by the patient. Quantity is one of the physical characteristics that we're going to be looking at. Polyuria. Remember, poly means many. This may indicate disorders such as diabetes or kidney disease. This is where you have an overproduction of urine. Oliguria can be indicative of dehydration, bleeding, decreased fluid intake, or kidney disease. And anuria may be a result of renal failure or an obstruction. Anuria is where you have to stop urinating. When you look at specific gravity, this is a rough estimate of the concentration of the urine. So the specific gravity is the weight of a substance in relation to the weight of the same amount of distilled water. Normal specific gravity ranges between 1.010 and 1.030. The presence of protein, glucose, or x-ray dyes may increase the specific gravity of urine, obviously because you are going to be spilling those waste products into your urine. Possible causes of abnormal specific gravity may include, if it's low, diabetes insipidus, glomerulonephritis, pyelonephritis, 
chronic renal disorders and excessive hydration. Remember, glomerulo is talking about the glomerulus, which is the basic unit of function within the kidney. Anything that has nef on it is dealing with the kidney. Itis is going to be an inflammation of. When you're dealing with high specific gravity, that may be a result of dehydration, diabetes mellitus, adrenal insufficiency, hepatic disease, which is liver disease, or heart failure. So most of you will be using what's called the dipstick method or the reagent strip method. We're going to be doing this in class quite a bit and you will be tested on this. This is the most commonly used method of measuring specific gravity. It's performed by dipping a chemically treated piece of plastic, which is the dipstick, into a sample of urine and then reading the chemical reaction that takes place on the dipstick. So you need to make sure that you are very accurate in recording the color that, associated, that is associated with the numbers on the stick. The test strip is evaluated by a chemical analyzer or by visual comparison with the results on the side of the test strip bottle. So usually on the test strip bottle, they have a visual representation of all the different components that you'll be testing for, and the color that is associated with the measurement of it will be next to it. This is always the method that I used as I was working in uh, the different offices. I never got to use an analyzer, which is usually commonly used in a lab, but however, there are physicians' offices that use that so you don't have to know visually. I do want you to know how to do this visually because it's important. This is an example of a urine being tested with the reagent strip. They're gonna go ahead and dip that down in there and they're going to wait the allotted one minute if they see any signs of leukocytes, they're also going to wait an additional minutes for their leukocytes. But after that one minute, they're going to hold up that strip next to the bottle and they're going to compare the colors and they're going to record the numbers. It is absolutely important that you be accurate with the numbers that you record. That'll be a part of the skills checkoff that you need to pass. Here is the MA holding the strip up next to the bottle. You can see that they're reading some of those colors and finding out what the associated number is with them. Another method of analyzing urine is the refractometer method. This is less common than the dipstick method, and a refractor may be used to determine the specific gravity. Refractometer uses light, a prism, and a calibrated scale to measure the concentration level of the specimen. The method may be seen in older offices or cost-efficient clinics. This is what a refractometer looks like. And you need to refer to procedure 46-4, um, evaluating the physical characteristics of urine for detailed instruction in this technique. We will not be doing this in class. However, you do need to know this. And these are just some of the physical characteristics, once again, of urine. You can see the large span of colors. This is evaluating a, the cloudiness of urine. You've got all the way from clear down to very cloudy. 46-5, please review that one. That's measuring the specific gravity of urine with the refractometer for instructions on this technique. Once again, another picture of what a refractometer looks like. You've got the eyepiece, the lens, temperature condensing dial, excuse me, temperature compensating dial, the cover plate, and the prism surface. So let's look at the different components or the chemical characteristics using the dipstick method. Um, the dipstick has small chemically treated pads that react with the specific chemicals in the urine to allow for measurement of specific elements. Color changes caused by the chemical reactions are compared to charts on the outside of the reagent strip container. These are known as pH, protein, glucose, ketones, blood, bilirubin, urobilogen, nitrates, leukocytes, and specific gravity. Normal and abnormal values of each of these are provided or evaluated by chemical urine analyzer. It provides information on functioning of the kidneys, the liver, and other organs. Physicians decide which chemical elements they want to test for based on the patient's status and possible diagnosis. And you read each test at a specific time. Information appears on the side of the reagent strip container. Like I said before, for leukocytes, typically, when you're reading that after one minute, if it shows any hint of being purple at all, you're going to wait an additional minute to read the leukocyte strip. 
These are just examples of the variety of chemical reagent strips. The ones that we will be using don't look quite like this bottle, but they're very similar in their setup. Please refer to Procedure 46.6, Testing with Chemical Characteristics of Urine with Reagent Strips for detailed instructions.